So when it comes to a person being grown up, we call them being mature, right? Thinking and acting like a grown up. But how do you measure that level of maturity? How do you measure that? What criteria do you use? What standards do people use to determine whether you're mature or immature? Is there such a standard? This morning we're going to be looking at a standard and let's pray and let's ask God to direct our thoughts here this morning. Lord, as we come to you here this morning, I pray that we will hear these ancient words that are forever true. And that we will be people who look at our own lives and will take responsibility for our spiritual growth. And that we will grow up to be mature believers. And that as mature believers, people are seeing the difference you make in our life. So Lord, guide and direct our thoughts here this morning. I pray that you are glorified in everything that we do. Jesus, we want to see you in the text In spirit, we pray that you implant these words on our heart so that we do grow and change to be more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does it mean to be mature? Being mature means having attained a final or desired outcome. Like we we talk about when your stocks mature, right? They get to a certain point where they're full, they're fully developed. And they're at that point where now you can take them out. That We talked about that with stocks. So what about when it comes to thinking and behavior? When it comes to deciding what is normal or abnormal thinking, what is mature or immature behavior? From a cultural standpoint, there doesn't seem to be any objective. There doesn't seem to be any objective standard for what should be normal and mature. Uh, my dad would, would say, some people, they're... They're just a few fries short of a Happy Meal. I mean, that's what he would say, right? And so you can see those kinds of people where you just look at them and say, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to start making decisions that are reflective of an adult mindset? Well, the problem is we live in a culture where anything and everything goes. When what is acceptable adult thinking really cannot be defined. In fact, who's to decide? Who gets to decide what is normal and right thinking? I mean, isn't it good for humanity to be progressing and greater acceptance of all thinking and behavior? I mean, isn't that where our world wants us to go? In other words, what will happen if we live in a culture where everyone is able to do that which is right in their own eyes? Has there ever been a period of history where that has happened? You just go back to the book of Judges. You can see what happens when we live in a culture where everything is acceptable. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. If you think it's right and mature for you to act that way, then go ahead. And what happens? You have total chaos. So maturity. There's a danger in living in a culture where there's no standard of what is right. And what is acceptable thinking? What is acceptable action? And so we want to be looking at that here this morning. See, this whole month we've been laying out our vision as a church. Who does God say we are? How is, has God equipped us? What, what is our mission? And so we've gone on record as saying that our mission is building lives to know and live for Jesus Christ. And what that means is that we're building into one another. We're building into one another those principles that are important to our Savior. And if they're important to our Savior, they ought to be important to us. And as we're building into one another, there's an expectation. There's an expectation that we're going to be changing. There's an expectation that we're going to be maturing. We're going to be growing into greater Christ-likeness. And so to do that, we're formulating some priorities. These are standards that God has set forth for us. And that we believe that if we live by them, if we are creating this fence post in which we can operate, then we'll be successful at this building lives to know and live for Christ. So far in our study, we've talked about two of them. We've talked about glorifying God. Our number one priority is to glorify God. It's not about who I am. It's not about people seeing how great I am or how great Open Door Bible Church is. It's about people seeing how great our God is. Everything we do is to point to our Father in heaven. And so we want to glorify God in all things. Then the second one we talked about last week is proclaiming Christ. Here at Open Door, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
We're not ashamed to tell people that the only way to heaven is through Christ alone. That Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and rose again for our sins. And it is only through him that we have eternal life. And we're not ashamed of that message. And we will never be ashamed of that message because it is in that message that we have the power to change in Christ. And so we've been talking about those. Until this morning, we're going to be talking about principle number three. What else do we care about? We care about being biblically obedient. It's understanding that everything has been given to us by God. He gave us everything we need for life and godliness. And, it, and it's through the understanding and application of His Word that we live out this mission. We put into practice how God expects us to live. And by doing that, we do it for His glory and we learn His Word. And, and so we're going to be looking at that here this morning. And so we're going to be in the book of Second Peter. So if Take your Bibles and open them to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I think what we're going to see in this text, it it hopefully is very clear to us. And it's this, that mature believers take responsibility for their spiritual growth. Maturing believers are going to take responsibility for their spiritual growth. And we want to see two truths that are going to challenge us to take ownership of that. Take ownership of your spiritual growth. Let's start in chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Let's stop there for, for just a few moments. The first truth that we we need to examine from this text is this. God has equipped us with everything we need for a life of godliness. These verses are connected to verse 2, which says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in what? The knowledge of God. The knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus. So, So there's a connection between grace and peace and our knowledge of God. Our call to godliness is rooted in secured by God's grace. God has given us all of that. And so what God demands of us, what God demands of us to be mature, to be growing, to be godly, is found in His gracious power. And the word knowledge is is used five times in this text. But what I find interesting is that in verses 2, 3, and 8, Peter uses one word for knowledge. And then in verses 5 and 6, he uses a different word. In verses 5 and 6, the word for knowledge there is just a general knowledge an acquisition of facts, an acquisition of truth. Okay, It's just a general knowledge. But the word that he uses in verses 2, 3, and 8 is a knowledge that is far deeper than just the acquisition of facts. It is an intimate knowledge. It is a deeper knowledge. A knowledge that is focused on a relationship. For example, I know that George Washington was our first president Because there were people who said that he was our first president. It was written down in the history books. So I know that. I accept that fact as truth. But when it comes to this deeper knowledge, does George Washington being the first president change me? No. I can accept that as fact, but it doesn't make me any different. The knowledge that we're talking about here is a relational knowledge that has an impact on your thinking, that has an impact on your actions. It's a deep relational knowledge. Because my belief in George Washington is far different than my belief in Jesus Christ. My belief in Jesus Christ changes who I am. I believe that He is a real person. I believe He is man. I believe He is God. And I believe that He died on the cross for me. And that He was buried and that He rose again for me. And that He died the death that I should have died on the cross. I believe all of that. And by my belief in Him, it now changes everything about me. It changes the way I think. It changes the way I live. It changes the way I talk. It changes the way that I I am married to my partner. It changes the way that I I parent my kids. Every single aspect of my life is changed as a result of my knowledge of Christ. That's the difference. And so all of this that we're talking about here is based on that relational knowledge that you have of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer here this morning, then you have an uh, you should have an intimate relationship with God. And as you are growing deeper in that, there ought to be evidence, and that is maturity. 
That's what we're talking about here. And so we want to understand that we are to be growing deeper in that knowledge. And that word godliness is a respect and an awe of God. Everything we need to live a life that is in respect and awe of God has been given to us. So that ability to live righteously and holy doesn't have to elude us. We don't have to struggle through life thinking, how in the world am I ever going to be righteous? How in the world am I ever going to live a godly life? See, sadly, there are many believers who, even though God has provided all we need, they search for answers to life in places outside God's Word. The very solutions that we need are bound into the ancient words. They're bound into Scripture Look at what God says to us regarding these things. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. We need to lay aside the the philosophies of the world. We need to reject those as those aren't going to help me get to the place where God wants me to be. We have to not be taken captive by that 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Everything that sets itself up above God, you need to do this. But what does God's word say about that? Take every thought captive And I love 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. My finger went a little bit faster than I wanted to. Equipped for every good work. Equipped for what? Every good work. So God's Word has given us everything. Our relationship with Christ has given us everything. So our spiritual maturity then begins and continues to happen when we believe in and are committed to the sufficiency of Christ and His Word because it tells us what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. If we believe in that, if we believe in the sufficiency of Christ, if we believe in the sufficiency of His Word, then we're going to be growing and changing. We're going to go after, what does God say? I'm going to lay aside what the world wants me to think. I'm going to lay aside and I'm going to just destroy all of that. And I'm going to look at what does God say. And I'm going to come down on God's side. Because He's given that to us. See, we're not going to grow in the way or at the rate God wants us to grow if we're not holding to the sufficiency of Christ, if we're not seeking our knowledge from the sources He has given to us. So what does this text say about what God has done for us? Well, he first, it says here that He equips us with divine power. Look at verse 3. So seeing that His divine power has granted to us, what? Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Whatever spiritual sufficiency we have is not because of who we are, it's because of the power we possess through Christ. It's His power in us. Paul expressed it this way in Ephesians 3.20. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is that same power that we have within us. It's a power that enables us to do more than we ever thought we could do. All the power that we need is already within us. It's not that we go through life and God surges power upon us. We don't get these just jolts of power, but when we realize all the power that we need is already here. It's already here. And what happens is we tend to disconnect from that power source. We disconnect from that power source. So sometimes if we feel like we've lost it, it's not because God has taken it away. It's because we don't stay connected to it. We look at God's Word and we say, well, I don't like that aspect of God's Word, so I'm not going to do it. And so now we are disconnecting 
ourselves from the power of God to change us in his word because we're going somewhere else. We fail to minister with it or we don't even use it. See, all the power we need is already there. We just need to stay connected to it. See, the, the point is, the fault is not God, it's ours. It's our fault if we feel powerless. That term has granted, that's written in a way that communicates something that happened in the past that has a continuing effect. Has a continuing effect on us. God permanently bestowed all the power that we need. And it doesn't say here that he's only supplied just enough, right? What's it say? It says everything. Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Think about it this way. If you wanted to climb a mountain, and that mountain was very high, and you went to this mountain, and you probably might come with a little bit of a backpack. So you might have some supplies to get up there. But at the base of the mountain is this shack that has all the supplies you need because the person who's running that shack has been to the top. And he knows everything that is needed to get you to the top. And he went and he bought it for you. And it's right there at your taking. How foolish would it be for us to think that we've got enough in our backpack to get there without going and talking to the supplier? That's what we mean by taking ourselves away from that power supply. The supply is all there. Everything we need to get to the top is there. Everything we need to mature in Christ has been given to us by God. So we have all those resources. So the bottom line then is obedience. Are we going to take what God has given and are we going to apply it? See, it's not a matter of needing more faith. Because what does Jesus say? The, the faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. So you don't need more faith. It's a matter of obedience. See, maturing in Christ, in part, is recognizing that saying I can't is really saying I won't. Because what does Philippians 4.13 say? I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. So when you think about that hard thing that God is asking you to do, when you read the Word of God and, and you recognize that, that God is asking you to do something, that in your mind you say, God, that's hard. I don't want to do it. It's too difficult for me to do. I can't do it. What you're really saying is, God, I won't do it. Because He's given you everything you need. All the power you need to live a godly life is already there. And so maturing in, in Christ is recognizing that saying I can is really saying I won't. So you can rest assured that, that God will empower you for all of life. You can live as an overcomer of all things. So obedience is an act of the will. Are you going to choose to do right? So then how can we experience that power in our life? It's through the knowledge of Him. So as you're growing in that intimate knowledge of God, then that power becomes more evident. That power becomes more evident in your life. So He's given us His divine power, but He's also given us divine promises. Again, He says, pertaining to life of God, through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence, for by these, His own glory and excellence, He granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. Because of all that Jesus accomplished, all of that is part of who we are. All that Christ is, we have. We have all the riches in Christ. And that word has given is the same as it was before. Something that happened in the past that has continuing effect. The moment we trust in Jesus Christ, all the promises that are revealed in Scripture become ours that are related to being in Christ. And time doesn't permit us to go through all the promises. That would be a good Bible study for you to go through and just trace all the promises that God has made to you. God wants to encourage you with those. So, so I just came up, these are some promises that, that have really meant something to me. And I've just kind of tried to identify some of them. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. But these are some that really impacted my heart. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, no matter where I go, whether I'm at the top of the mountain or whether I'm in the valley, the Holy Spirit is with me. And even when I choose not to obey Him, He doesn't leave me and go somewhere else. He indwells me permanently. He is with me always. That's a promise that, that really 
uh, means a lot to me. Abundant grace. I don't know about you, but I, I sure am thankful for the abundant grace that God bestows upon me. Where would we be without that abundant grace? Let that be a promise that encourages you. How about joy? The joy doesn't depend on my circumstances. Joy is a result of my relationship with Christ. I have joy because of who I am in Christ, not because of where I am in life. Strength. When I am trying to do things on my own strength and I fail, I have the strength of God in my life. Strength is always there for me. Guidance. I'm so thankful that He gives us His Word. He gives us His Spirit. He gives us prayer to help guide us and to navigate those treacherous waters of this life. We have that guidance, but then ultimately our home in heaven. Aren't you glad this is not your home? You sure don't sound very confident. Aren't you glad this isn't your home? Amen. Our home is in heaven. We are not citizens here. We're citizens of heaven. And that is promised to us because of Christ. And those ought to be things that encourage us as we walk this world, as we walk in this world. We don't need to be a, a partner of this world, but we can walk in godliness because He is encouraging us through His promises. But he also enables us with a divine partnership. In verse 4, uh, you see, for by this He has granted us to His precious, magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of of the divine nature. That word partakers is the word, is the word koinos, which is the word fellowship. It also means sharer, a partner. Every believer is in a partnership with God. You are belonging to Him. And notice he says you don't partake in His being. You can't be God. It's not what he's saying, but you participate in His nature. That nature of holiness. We have God's holiness in our life. We are partnering with God in that holiness. Now, we can't be perfect. We know that. Okay? But in position, we are already perfect, like we talked about last week. With God, we're already perfectly holy. And so we are practicing then, in this life, we're putting on that holiness that God has already granted to us. So what Peter says here is that believers share that holiness. We share in that holiness of God, and we experience that through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, it says we escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. Escaping the corruption, the moral decay, because we have that holy nature within us. We're called to live in this world, but not to be a partner of the world. We're to be a partner with God. Holiness is not just possible, it's expected. All of us are expected to be holy. Why? Because we have the holy nature of God within us. So God's provided everything we need. But now, as we move into the next section, I think we're going to see this. We are responsible to diligently apply biblical truth to all of life. That's our responsibility. Look at verse 5. Now, for this very reason also, because God has provided everything we need, Applying all diligence, and your faith supply moral excellence, and your moral excellence knowledge, and your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Do you see the responsibility that we have you look in verse 5 and you look at verse 10, you see the word diligence. In verse 10 he says, be all the more diligent. There's an urgency to this. There, there, there ought to be a sense of urgency in our life that we need to be growing and maturing in Christ. And he says here that you have that responsibility, applying diligence in your faith supply. All of those are terms that he's given to us to do. That word apply means to bring in. We don't earn our salvation by working for it, but we show our salvation by letting it work, it work itself out in us. 
That word supply literally means to contribute lavishly and generously. And this is really an interesting word and and how it changed over the, the usage of time. This word is where we get our word choreography from. Like, well, What does that have to do with anything? Well, it originally started by referring to a choir master. That's what the word originally meant, was a choir master. There was this position as the choir master that you had this group of people who were your choir, and it was on you as a choir master to supply everything your choir needed to have a good performance. It was your job at your expense. If you wanted your group, your choir, to do well, you had to provide everything that they needed. And so over the course of time, this word morphed from being a choir master to a supplier. And he says, you are that supplier. So in other words, what has to happen is that we have to come alongside We have to come alongside all that Christ has supplied. And we are to employ a maximum disciplined effort. We are to train ourselves for godliness. We are to grow in the virtues necessary to please God. That discipline is a daily sustained effort. Effort. We discipline ourselves all the time, don't we? We discipline ourselves to go to bed. We discipline ourselves to take care of our bodies, right? We discipline ourselves to take showers. We, you know, all these things. Think about all these things that you discipline yourself to do. Why then do you not discipline yourself to be godly? That's what we're talking about here. It's our responsibility. It's not a. It's not a let go and let God. You hear that said, all, I just need to let go and let God. No, that's not what we're talking about here. See, there's this tension in Scripture that says, God has provided everything you need for salvation, and it's He who has saved you. But there's this tension that says, now that you're saved, you have the responsibility to live that out. And that's what Peter is talking about here. So as we understand this, this is what Peter tells us. First, we have to put on godly virtues. That's what he's talking about in verses 5 to 7. Um, my wife likes to use essential oils. I mean, whenever there's an ailment in my body, I say, do you have an oil for that? And she says, yes, I've got an oil for that. And yes, she's always got an oil for that. All right? So you can look at verses 5 to 7 as these are the spiritual essential oils. These are the essential oils that every one of us need to be putting onto our life. And they need to be growing on us. We need to be bathing ourselves. Sometimes I feel like I bathe myself in those essential oils when I'm sick, right? But they help. They're very helpful. And so that's what this is here. These are the essential oils of biblical living. And Peter doesn't really give us an explanation of them, but here's what they are. Moral excellence. It's that proper fulfillment of your duty. That moral heroism. It's that ability to escape the corruption of the world by going to a higher level of morality. And then you grow in your knowledge, that knowledge of truth that leads you to greater moral heroism. And then it leads you to greater self-control. That word self-control means holding oneself in. And then you persevere. That's patient endurance and doing what is right. It carries the idea of remaining strong in unwelcome turmoil. You persevere through those hard things. Godliness, a reverence for God. You properly honor and adore Him. Brotherly kindness, it's that fervent, practical caring for one another. And then there's love, desiring the highest good for others. And what I find interesting is that love is at the the end of this list. Meaning that you really can't love the way God wants you to love unless you are growing in your moral excellence. Unless you're growing in your knowledge. Unless you are growing in your self-control. Unless you're growing in perseverance. You can't love the way God wants you to love unless you're growing in all these ways. We have to actively be putting those on. Growing in those. But he goes on to say in verses 8-9 to that It's not just enough to put these on, but we have to open our eyes to the truth. We have to open our eyes to the truth. Look with me at verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. We have to open our eyes to the truth. See, our true, true spiritual growth is going to have an impact on those around us. We're going to be effective and productive. You see the word useless there. It means inactive or idle. It conveys the idea of something being uh, unserviceable, inoperative, and then unfruitful. You're barren. Sadly, there are believers who know the Lord in salvation, but never move beyond the elementary principles. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says in 5 verses 12 to 14, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. We need to be growing in our relationship with God and so that we become fruitful. And so he goes on, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say that by uh, discernment, we learn to apply these things and we know the difference between good and evil. See, the non-growing Christian is what the Scriptures would refer to as carnal. They're blind. They're nearsighted. They suffer from what is known as spiritual myopia. In fact, that word myopia comes from this Greek word. The believer with spiritual myopia, the word for nearsighted is myopazan. And it literally means to close the eye. To close the eye. Which says it's a willing choice. The believer who suffers from spiritual myopia is blinded to the truth. In other words, they've closed their eyes to considering the way they're living their life and they're just going to live it their way regardless of what the Word of God says. They're just going to go out and do whatever they want to do And they're going to be blind to the fact that they're not productive. They're not showcasing the glory of Christ in their life to change them. They willfully have closed their eyes to the truth. And having forgotten there literally reads having received forgetfulness, which suggests a voluntary acceptance. They voluntarily accept the fact that their, their deeds are going to be wrong, but they're okay with that. They're okay with living in darkness. The believer who justifies their sin is the person who is living with a spiritual myopia. They're choosing not to testify of the grace. Is that the condition of your heart here this morning? That you accept your sin as no big deal? That it's okay for you to live in sin? You know what the Word of God says. I hear this all the time. I know what God's Word says, but the moment you throw that Word in there, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You have now gone down the path of developing a spiritual myopia. You're blind. You need to be proving yourself as useful. Proving yourself as one who is growing in these things. And once you do that, Once you recognize the truth of the Word of God, you recognize the truth of your sin, the truth of your growth process. Once you recognize those, then he goes on to say in verses 10 to 11, we can enjoy the assurance of our salvation. He says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance of the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. We enjoy the assurance of our salvation. Make certain about His calling and choosing you. In other words, when we choose to live godly lives, we're proving that we've been changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says what? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. The guarantee here is not that we're not going to sin. It's a a guarantee that we're not going to fall. See, the burden of spiritual maturity clearly rests on us. What he's saying by not stumbling there, it's not that you're not going to sin, but the believer who is growing in their knowledge of God, the believer who is growing and applying these virtues to their life, the believer who is maturing is not going to be so quickly swayed to forsake God. Is not going to be one who's just going to throw his principles out and go another way. So you're assured of your salvation. Our abundant entrance into heaven is guaranteed. 
It's guaranteed in Christ. It's not something we work for. But it is abundantly assured by the confession of our heart because we live with evidence of life change. Not only do we experience full assurance here, but when we get to glory, that assurance will be completely revealed. So life step. What do we, what do, we do with what this text tells us? It's this. Take ownership of your spiritual growth. Take ownership of your spiritual growth. No one can be more committed to your spiritual growth than you. You've got that responsibility. James 1.22 says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. See, as a church, we can supply the multiple opportunities for you to come and to hear the word of God to receive biblical instruction. It's up to you to do with that what is necessary. As pastors and elders, we want you to know we love you dearly and we want to shepherd you well. But your spiritual growth is on you. It's your responsibility. We can come alongside you and we can take you through the Scriptures. We can help you understand it. But it's your job to take that, apply it, let it change how you think. So as we walk away from here, we must apply maximum effort to growing and changing. What are you going to do with all those opportunities that are before you to learn the Word of God? Your growth in Christ is only stunted if the only time you open His Word is for one hour on Sunday morning. Is this the only meal you get in a week? Then you're going to be weak. So what are you doing? Progressive sanctification is that process of learning and applying biblical truth more consistently as we live in a sin-cursed world. Every response to life, every thought we possess must be taken captive by the Word of God, allowing that to penetrate our hearts so that when life happens, your cup overflows with righteousness because that's what's in your cup. Your growth is going to happen when you take advantage of all the opportunities placed before you to be impacted by the transforming power of His living Word. As a church, we're going to continue to provide all the avenues we can to be in, inputting into your life spiritual truth. What are you going to do to take advantage of those? It's what you do with those that will make the difference in your life. It's all of us have that responsibility for our spiritual growth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word here this morning. And Lord, I pray that we will recognize our need to be involved in that spiritual growth process and that you provided everything we need. And so now... You have placed upon us the responsibility to grow and to mature in you. So Lord, challenge us with these words. And I pray that if anyone needs to know you today, that today would be the day where they come. For those who do know you, I pray that today would be the day where they take steps of growth to apply what they've learned here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.